So as we're in the middle of this 21 days of prayer and fasting, we were actually on vacation for the month of July, and I knew 21 days of prayer was coming. Uh, and so I, you know, geared up and I started reading books on prayer uh, and just wanting to center my heart. Lord, teach me more about prayer. I've been a Christian my entire life, <laughs> uh, but I fully gave my life to Jesus when I was 12 years old and just went, you know, 100% towards Jesus all the time. So it's been how many years, decades of me following the Lord, but still I'm learning things about him. Still, I'm learning things about myself. Still, I'm being drawn into deeper understanding and depths of prayer. Uh, and so I want to share with you a quick little story. Just a couple weeks ago, I was, um, we had been on vacation. We'd come back in to work, and I was super excited to get back into the swing of things. But then some things came up that were kind of unexpected, and I felt myself being a little bit tense and anxious and worried. Anybody? Anybody ever felt like that? You know, when you're like really, really hungry, but there's something going on inside your stomach, and so you really just can't eat, you know? Like I'm starving, but I've got so much going on, so much I'm thinking about that I, I can't even force food down my throat. <laughs> um, or when it gets time to bedtime, like you're fine, you've been fine all day, like it's kind of been lingering in the background, whatever it is that you're dealing with. But then it gets time to go to bed, and you know, like, oh man. It just like creeps up on you, all the weight and the heaviness settles down. And so you, you're like so ready to go to sleep because you're so tired. And the next day, you know, you've got something going on and it would be really helpful to get a good night's sleep, but you're just up, you know, you're thinking about it. And what I hate about that is what am I going to do about it in the middle of the night? It's three in the morning brain. Are you going to make a call right now? No. You know, like then go, go to sleep unless you're going to pray about it. You know, get up and legitimately pray about it. Then just go to sleep. Turn off. Um, and so I was kind of in one of those things. It was um, a day where I was having, the morning was great. I felt like I had given what I, I'm practicing prayer, 21 days of prayer. So I sat up. I sat in my chair. We had this new gray chair. It faces out the window. I've got my blankie because it's cold in the morning. And I, I have read the word and I have prayed and it has been good. And then I go about my day and that thing just like it creeps back up in my heart. It keeps back into my life. And so I'm laying down at night and the next day I've got stuff going on and I've got little kids and I need sleep. So if I don't get sleep, I'm a monster, which is the worst, you know, and I'm not teaching my kids to be monsters. So I need the grace of God every day to just be a nice mom. So I'm laying in bed, I get in bed and I, my head hits the pillow. No joke. It's 10 o'clock. And I'm like, that's bedtime, 10 o'clock. And it's kind of settling on me, and I know, like, I just have that feeling, I'm not going to sleep well tonight. I just, I want to, but I know I'm not going to. And then it was like the Lord said to me, he reminded me of a scripture that says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. You know, Peter says that to the church. He says, cast all your anxieties, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And there's another scripture in Philippians uh, where he says, with praise and thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I was like, I, I know that, and I want that, and I feel like I've been doing that. But it was like the Lord kind of showed me this picture of, have you ever tried to teach somebody how to do something, but you didn't really teach them? <laughs> Like, you showed them, but you wouldn't let them do it, you know? So you're like, let me show you how to send an email. I've had to show people how to send email. And I, I'm doing it all, and they're just standing me watching, and then I send them away. They haven't learned a thing because they haven't done anything. How many of us? We've done that. Okay? Maybe not email, something else. Or you're just like, oh, let me get in there because you're doing it wrong. Of course, they're doing it wrong. They haven't done it before. Like, you got to teach them. Be okay with letting them fail. So this is what I'm doing with, with the Lord. I'm, I'm telling him about my problem. Like, he's with me, and I know he's with me, and I'm, I'm like talking about it to him, but I didn't invite him to do anything with it. So all day, like I'm in prayer, you know, and I'm telling him about it, but I didn't ask him for help. Make your request known to God. And so I'm, I'm laying in bed, my head's on the pillow, and I'm going, Father. And so it was something shifted. Instead of talking to the Lord about something, now I'm, I'm telling him what's really going on inside my heart. I am anxious about some things going on that I don't have any control over. And it worries me because I'm afraid that this is going to happen or I'm afraid that this is. So I started taking, like, I identified some of those fears and the things that were causing the anxiety. And I'm, I'm in my bed. Elliot's next to me. He has no idea what's going on because I'm mumbling under my breath, you know, because I don't want to be exposed. <laughs> Weird. And Elliot even said something to me, and I just mumbled back to him. I don't remember what he said. And so I'm, but I'm praying like, Father, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious about that. And as I began to do that, he began to remind me of who he is. And so there was this, this both and, like, I'm anxious, but you're good. 
I, I'm worried about this, but I know that you're my protector. And so I'm, I'm offering it to you, and I'm asking you to guard my heart and my mind with who you are. And I wear a watch, you know, to, it's my alarm in the morning when I need an alarm, but it also tracks my sleep. And so I like to look at my sleep trends. And normally what happens is I'm awake and then I go like I dip into light sleep and then I'll dip into deep sleep. And when I woke up the next morning, I, I woke up and it was like I had fallen asleep and I didn't wake up again. And I, but when I woke up, I remembered how anxious I was the night before. And I was like, Man, God, you're so good. I slept so good last night. Like, why don't I do that all the time, you know? And then I looked at my sleep later, and I had went from, I wasn't awake at all. It was like I, I immediately dipped right into deep sleep, and I stayed there until I went back through my other cycles. But the Lord is faithful, and he is good, and his promises are true. And so as we learn to pray, and as the Lord reveals himself to us, he can be trusted. And there are new layers and depths to that. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about praying for the lost. There are lost people looking for answers. When I say lost people, I mean people who have never heard of Jesus. They have never heard the, the good news of the Son of God. They, have, they may have an idea about God, but they don't know our God and Father the way that we know him. He's out here, but we have a relationship with the living God. And there are lost people who have no idea what that feels like. And they're looking for hope. They're looking for answers. They're looking for healing. They're desperate for supernatural things. They're desperate for a move of God. They just don't know that. There are lost people who need our prayers. And then there are saved people who are lost in a current struggle. You know, maybe they, they, there was an unexpected loss in the family. And so they're, they're dealing with that and they're lost in this situation because they know the Lord, but maybe the Lord doesn't feel present or they don't feel present with the Lord in those moments. Maybe, you know, we've, we know people who know, love the Lord wholeheartedly most of the time, but they're lost in a struggle or a pursuit of the things of this world that are kind of distracting them from the things of God. So we know they love Jesus. There's just a little bit of confusion about who they should be pursuing or what they should be pursuing. Just last week, I was a lost person. I was lost in anxiety. I was lost in fear. I was lost in stress. And the way out of it was prayer, talking with my Savior, talking with my Father. And so I'm convinced that most of us want to pray. We just need practice. <laughs> we want to pray. We just need some more practice. I'm convinced that most of us believe that our God is a God of miracles, that he can move mountains, that he is present in our struggle, that when we're in the deepest, darkest valley, we can praise him like we're on the mountains we just need practice in doing it. We, we believe those things. We just need practice in acting on them. And I'm convinced we all know lost people who can't see any light, and we know saved people who are lost in a struggle. And so today, I just want to talk us through how to pray for the lost. Are we good with that? So let's do that. If you are following along and like to take notes, we do have fill in the blank, so you can pull out the sermon notes in your bulletin. Or if you're on the YouVersion Bible app, you can pull that up and start following along there as well. So the first thing we're going to do, we're just going to jump right into it. When we're praying for the lost, one of the first and best things we can do is ask our Father or ask God to draw them to Jesus. The very first thing we can do is ask our Father in heaven to draw the, their hearts toward Jesus. Now, these are the words. I'm going to read a scripture. It's out of John chapter 6, verse 44. These are the words of Jesus, and he's talking to people who are following him. Some of the people who are following him had chosen to believe in Jesus. They had already begun to see him as the Savior, the Messiah, in whatever limited context they can understand him as. And then other people were simply following him because he had heard, they had heard he had done really cool things, and they just wanted to hear this teacher. And this is what Jesus says to a mixed crowd. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. Very simple scripture, but what I want us to see here is that people, we don't come to the Father unless Jesus draws us. And so what we're asking is we're asking the Father in heaven to draw people to his Son. Father, I ask that you would draw these people to your Son. And we do that because the Son of God, it says, the Scripture says, everyone who believes in the Son of, of God, everyone who believes in the Son will have eternal life, will be saved. There is salvation in no one else. We must see Jesus. And we live in a world and a culture who may or may not be okay with a higher power who may or may not be, be, be okay with a grander being, but we want them to see not only God, because God can be this, I mean, it can be anything, really. A God can be anything. What we want people to see is the Son of God. 
Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, the healer, the one who comforts us in all our troubles, the one who meets us in our needs, the one who is able to get God is there, but it is Jesus who connects us to the Father. And so we want to ask the Father, would you draw them to Jesus? Would you let them see your son? Because he has revealed himself. Now, people, what's cool about this scripture too is we understand that people will not find God in their own strength and with their own cunning. If you go back in your story, I can go back in my story. I grew up in church, but I didn't find God because I was so strong and I was so cunning and I was so smart. I found God because he showed me Jesus. And if you go back in your own story, you can see the same thing. You found the Lord because Jesus came and comforted you. Jesus revealed himself. You put your faith in him, and then there was salvation. There was now a connection to the creator in heaven. In the same way, there are people around you, and God is drawing them to his son. He is already at work in their life. And so what you can do is you can partner with the work that God is already doing by just simply asking, Father, would you let them see your son? Would you let them see Jesus? Whatever it takes, would you let them see him? And then this is a prayer that Jesus prays about his disciples. So this is a prayer specific to believers. So if you're in the room, you believe in Jesus, you believe in the son of God as the son of God, this is what Jesus prays for us. He says, Father, I want those you gave me to be with me right where I am so they can see my glory the splendor you gave me having loved me long before there ever was a world I made your very being known to them who you are and what you do and I continue to make it known so that your love for me might be in them as exactly as how many of you guys want the father's love like (laughs) I can tell you that the father loves Jesus, the son, so stinking much. You know, Jesus knows he's loved. He is confident. He is secure. There is a father in heaven who he can run to with, I mean, Jesus, he's fully God, so he doesn't need to run for anything. But when Jesus was present on the earth with every struggle, there was a father in heaven who loved him, and he knew it. And Jesus says, I want that for my people. I want that for my people so that we're not lost in a present struggle. We're never distracted from the things of the world because our love, the love of the Father is so strong in us that's pulling us towards him. So Jesus wants his being, his essence, who he is to be fully present and awake inside of those who believe in him. And it's because the Father is fully alive inside of Jesus, and Jesus wants us to have everything that he had. And so while it's great, I'm going to kind of bring this in more specifically. While it's great to pray for general everyone who doesn't know Jesus, all the lost people, then the scriptures tell us to do that. The scriptures say pray for all believers and pray for people everywhere that everyone would come to know Christ. So there's a command in scripture to pray for generally all lost people to come to know the Father. And there's also a scripture that says Jesus ain't coming back until the whole world is heard. And there's another scripture that says God is uh, not slow. He's patient, not wanting anyone to be left out of the, of the family of God. And so he, he, there's, a, there's a command that we need to pray for the people who have not met him yet. But more specifically to help us because we, we believe those things. We want those things. We just need practice in asking. And so a simple way to practice asking is bring it into the people in your circle. Who specifically... Is the Lord putting on your heart or your mind right now a coworker, a neighbor, a friend, a family member? I could be praying specifically for them because I can see some things in their life. And so I'm just going to go through. It'll go up on the screens. This is also, there's a separate insert in your notes that just has this prayer on it. And it says this, Father, I pray for the people around me, including, and then you list their names, that you would draw their hearts to you. I ask that you would help them recognize their longing for more in life as a spiritual thirst that only Jesus could quench. I ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to them and give them the desire to give their lives to you and to live their life out of the overflow from you. And you can take that prayer. It's a simple prayer. Is it like heresy to just repeat the prayer? Absolutely not. Go for it. But as you pray the prayer, think about the people. Slow down and let your heart connect with the words that you're saying and just practice it. And as you practice it, the Lord will fill in the gaps and he'll give you more things and more people to begin to pray for. Uh, So the next thing we can do is we can bind the spirit that blinds their minds. You can fill that in. Bind the spirit that blinds their minds. 
So sometimes what happens is we can see a spiritual thing that's happening in the life of another person. Whether they're trapped in anger or bitterness, you can see that they're kind of trapped in unforgiveness. Sometimes we can see a spiritual struggle that's going on um, with people. And so what we can do is we can pray a little bit more clearly when the struggle has been identified. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says this. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. So this, these are Christian people. And he says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They do not understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So for a lot of people, it's not that they don't want to believe in God. There's an enemy of their soul who has blinded them and kept them from being able to engage or understand or lean into the person of God. And so as the people of God, we bind that spirit. And, and I'll read that. So when you're praying for someone who needs the Lord, pray that they would see him without any obstacles or distractions. And pray against whatever is in their way so that they can see the light of God. Pray that they can see God's power. And pray that they can experience his love based on their own, this is huge, their own encounter with him and not what someone else has told them. Ask that they would, they would set aside all the things they think they know about God, and God, would you just meet them right where they are? Would you meet them in the shower? Would you meet them in the bathroom? Would you meet them in their car? Would you meet them in their dreams? You are a real active and living God, and you love their soul. Would you meet them in that place? Um, there's another scripture, 2 Corinthians, same uh, same letter to the same people, chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. This is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, we use God's mighty weapons not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and we teach them to obey Christ. This is my favorite things because we're not going to go up with our own words, our own cunning, our own strength, and convince someone to believe in God. With our prayers, we are going to tear down strongholds and lies behind enemy lines, and then that person is going to come rushing out into freedom. There are people that I know that I have prayed, uh, Lord, they can't see you because they believe this or they believe this or they believe this. That is, that's a false argument. That's a stronghold. That's a struggle. And so in the name of Jesus, it says there's a veil that covers their eyes. I ask that you would remove that veil and that they would see you face to face. Lord, I ask that everything they believe about you that is not true would be torn down. Lord, that they would, be, they would be able to engage in conversations with believers who are able to engage in that conversation lovingly and let them see the light of God that they have not seen before. When you're praying for someone who needs to remember the Lord, because this is kind of a little bit more about believers. Someone who needs to remember the Lord. I know the Lord. I am saved. I'm going to heaven when I die. But my Christian life is more than about going to heaven when I die. It's about living an abundant life full of grace and power and strength and mercy here and now. And sometimes I just need to remember the Lord. I know he's out here, but I need to remember him face to face. I need to cast my anxieties and my fears on him. I need to have an intimate relationship with my God and tear down those strongholds and those lies that set themselves up against who I know my creator to be. So again, here's another prayer. You can just say it verbatim. Father, I thank you for whoever the people are, and I ask that you would, they would be able to see you clearly, to recognize who you are and give their hearts to you. Or give their hearts to you again. Because how many of you know every single day I wake up and I say, Father, I'm yours. I thank you for the sacrifice of your son. I am awake and alive because I have life in you. And I want to give my life to you again today. So that's not just something we do every Sunday. Every day I wake up and I recommit my life. I remind myself. He doesn't need that. I'm, I'm his. I'm bought with a price. I need to remind myself. I was bought with a price, and I belong to my Savior, and so my life is yours again today, and I remember you. There's something we do. It's called the first 15. If you haven't heard of it, it's the way that we remember God. We put him first every day. So the first 15 is I wake up. For the first five minutes, I get on a Bible plan, and I read five minutes of Scripture. If you're on the YouVersion Bible app and you're in the events tab, the Solid Life Bible reading plan is a link in there. You can click on it and start that plan. Five minutes in scripture. And then it's five minutes in worship. Or You can do it kind of out of order, but it's scripture, prayer, and worship. So five minutes in scripture opens my heart to like, thank you, Father. And I begin to pray. And I begin to ask him for things. And then I close in worship. And I remember the Lord. I, I sing songs of praise. You, you get 
a Spotify playlist of worship songs, and it's the first 15. And what it does is it helps us to center and remember the Lord every day. Because if there's a lost world out there who needs the Father, but we haven't remembered him, how are they going to hear? How are they going to know? It's our responsibility. The Lord has called us and empowered us and equipped us, okay? To, so keep going with that prayer. To recognize who they are and give their hearts to you again. I am not, this is a scripture, I am not unaware of the enemy's devices. He is a liar and he's a deceiver. He is lying to and deceiving these people. Because of what Jesus has done on the cross, I bind the work of the enemy and I expose him. I ask that the lies and deceptions which are keeping these people trapped in anxiety or fear or anger or depression, loneliness, whatever it is, Bitterness would be exposed, and they would clearly see Jesus. You bind the enemy, you call it out, you expose the lie, and they would clearly see Jesus, their defender and their creator. And again, some of that may be like, oh, I don't understand all that language. That's fine. Wrestle with it. Find those scriptures. If you look, if you just Google a lot of that sentence, you'll find scripture that matches it. And then you can go read the backstory of that scripture, and it will, knowing the scripture, knowing the truth, will empower you to pray it boldly because Jesus has asked you to do it. Amen. And so wrestle with it, learn to pray with it. Um, you can take that practice. The next thing is pray with a non-judgmental attitude. Anybody? Anybody really judgy up in here? Okay. I just talked to someone this morning, judgy. Okay. Super fun. Pray with a non-judgmental attitude. Here it is. When we intercede or pray for someone else without love, we pray without power. If you pray without love, you pray without power. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. You guys know 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is all this. So, so. Are you praying with that? It says this. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Who cares, basically? If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such a faith that I could move mountains but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. And so a common form of lovelessness is a judgmental spirit. <laughs> and how easily, guys, how easily when we pray with deep concern for others can we allow a critical spirit to creep in? We're praying for them, and we want things to happen in their life, but we're critical of them, maybe, and we can't even engage in a real relationship with them because we, we hate them. We hate what they are doing. We, we, you know, ah, there's things. Don't, don't pretend like that ain't never happened to you. <laughs> Jesus will deal with it, okay? This is what it says. In, um, so what I want us to do is I want to look at Paul's prayers because there are a lot of recorded prayers in Scripture that Paul prayed for the church. And can I tell you that the church then wasn't perfect. So much correction also went into these letters. If you read the letters, he corrected them, and then he loved them, and then he prayed for them. Okay, so we're going to look at some of the prayers that Paul wrote. But in Philippians, um, so even those who needed correction, we're going to look at Philippians his, his request, he was praying to God the Father in a letter, so the people were reading the prayers. Could the people you're praying for read the prayers you're praying for them? What would it do to the people if you were writing out these prayers for the people? What would it do to their hearts if you were to read the things you were saying about them and the things you were asking them of them? Because Paul wrote it into a letter, and they could read it, and it transformed them when they read it. So what kind of prayers are we praying for people? Uh, his, his requests were not filled with negative requests, but thanksgiving and positive requests with the things he wanted to see in their life. So Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. Paul did not say, I pray that you will get over your quarreling. He didn't, you won't read that in scripture. I pray that you would stop being idiots. I pray that you would stop you know, calling each other bad names behind each other's back. Like he didn't say, that was probably, all of that was probably happening, but that's not what he prayed. This is what he prayed, Philippians 1, 9. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. Paul prayed against what was happening with what he wanted to see. He challenged them. And that was more of an out loud prayer in essence because they read it. But before he wrote it, he prayed it in his heart. And he saw the negative and he overcame it with the positive. And that's what I want to see. That's what I'm empowering. That is what I'm sending out to be accomplished. And so when we're concerned about a person's negative qualities, 
It helps to think through to those corresponding positive ones that you actually want to see take place in their life. Because you could, this is like a quotable, it's easier to pray for the positives than against the negatives. It's easier to pray for the positives than against the negatives. So for some other prayer examples, I'm not going to look at all these, but you can look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. These are in your notes. You can look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12, and you can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Those are all Paul, prayers that Paul wrote to the church, and he was praying for people. But I do want to read Ephesians. This is another prayer. Chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, so you can follow along with me. It says, I pray, this is what Paul wrote, I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. In other words, he didn't say, I pray that you will grow out of your weaknesses. <laughs> he says, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. He didn't say, Father, I pray against their lack of trust. I pray that they would trust you more and more. Then your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. In other words, the people he was working with were shallow, and they were tossed to and fro by every idea and every plan. And he says, I pray that your love, your roots will grow down deep into the Father's love, and you would know that, and you would see that. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. And so sometimes they you're praying for someone and you think like they're never going to get it. <laughs> Just pray that they'll get it anyway. Like I pray that they would see it. They would know it. They would know your power. Uh, so many good things. Okay. And then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And then the last thing you can do is pray for believers to cross their path. You can write that down. Pray for believers to cross their path. And this, I could have put Christians, I could have put Jesus followers. I specifically am using the word believers because we're asking the Lord to bring people who are believing the promises of God into connection with these people who need God. Because it's one thing to be a Christian, and it's another thing to believe the promises of God. And I don't know about you, but I want lost people discovering the promises of God and becoming better at faith than I am. I don't want to be the late on what God is doing in the world. And so I want believers who are better than me, although he can use me <laughs> in my limited understanding, my limited resources. But I want believers to come across the paths of lost people because they need to see Jesus as their Savior. Okay, so have you ever noticed that God brings just the right people into our lives at just the right time. Has that ever happened to you in, an, in a moment, in a circumstance? He brings along a new person who is just what you needed. So when we pray for other people to join the family of God, it also helps to ask the Lord to bring people who can stand with them who they're going to need in that season. And the reason is twofold. Number one, we can pray for other Christians to influence those people around them positively. But the second thing is it does is it reminds us as of our part to play. Because if I am a believer, get this, if you're a believer praying for lost people to come to see Jesus, you can better believe that there's another believer out there praying that a believer will cross one of their friends. You are it. You are it. And so when you pray, Father, I ask that you would bring other believers to cross their path. Are you an answer to prayer for a prayer that someone else is praying? And is your life going to lead them to Jesus because you are the believer in their pathway? That's good stuff. Okay, God usually reveals himself to the lost through those who already love and serve him. There are scriptures about that. It says, how are they going to put their faith in Jesus unless they've heard? You can read about that. And how are they going to put their faith in Jesus unless they've heard? And how are they going to hear unless someone goes and tells them? And it says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We are the bringers of good news, people. So here's another a scripture you can pray. And that's not a scripture, just a prayer. Father... I pray for the lost around me, and you list their names, to meet believers who will influence them in a positive way. And then, Lord, let my life shine in such a way that people will want to know the God I serve. And this is a good place for ourselves to repent if you notice that you have lacked faith, that you have lacked trust, that you have lacked the presence of Jesus within you in the places and spaces where you find yourself. And then you keep praying, Father, allow others to see my genuine love and concern for them in all that I say and do. Let me be your hands and feet to serve them and let them know just how much you love them. And so it's an invitation and a call like my God has called me 
Nothing we can do can draw another human being to God like prayer. <laughs> Nothing we can do can draw another person or another human being to God like prayer. I know when I look around the room, I know of answered prayers because I've heard stories and I have talked with people within this church. I know people of Lifeline, you guys have been praying for your friends. You have been praying for your families. You've been praying for your neighbors. You've been praying for your coworkers. And I know that for some of us, you have seen them find God and you have seen transformation that was impossible because we serve a God who can do infinitely more than we could ever ask or imagine if we w but believe and ask him. And so I know, I know there are stories. I know there are testimonies of God's goodness and his faithfulness. When God has burdened you, you have responded to the call. In your limited understanding, however limited you felt, you have prayed and he has answered in my own life. I have story after story after story of position and place I was put in where I felt ill-equipped and not qualified, and there they were. Elliot told a story a couple weeks ago about a coworker I had, and his description of me was accurate. If you've met me, I am not the boldest, most courageous person you've ever met. It's not how you would describe me. In fact, I hide against the wall and I watch you <laughs> until I am comfortable enough to engage. And even then I'm terribly awkward and my palms are sweating, my armpits stink. Like, it's a thing. And you, if, you, if you heard my story, you know that. And so it's not in my own strength. It's not in my own cunning. It's not in my own power. It's because I want people to know the same God I know. And so when I see people faced with a struggle, I begin to pray for them as best I can. And these are some prayer examples. I put a um, card, so you sat on it when you walked in or you moved it aside and said, what the heck is this? It's just a blank business card. It's a white blank business card. And in closing, what I'm inviting you to do is write the names of the people who have come to mind today. There are lost people, people who have never heard the good news of Jesus in your circle. And then there are saved people who have met Jesus maybe once or twice before, but they don't know him. And so they're still lost in some kind of struggle and they're not remembering the Lord. They don't know what great power and access they have to the throne room of the king. And so write those, that card's for you. It's business size, card size, so it'll fit in your wallet. You can keep it in your wallet. You can put it in your dashboard. You can put it in a discreet place at work. And it doesn't say Lifeline Church on it. It doesn't say anything. So if you write it, you need to write a nickety name. So if they happen to come across that card and see their name on it, what, what is this? Why are you carrying my name in your pocket? <laughs> because I like you. That's weird. If you need to write a nickname or like purple, because like they remind you of the color purple, whatever it is, so they don't find it, but you know who it is and you keep it with you, and it's a reminder to pray, to pray for the lost, to pray for them, because on the other side of that, he, our God can do infinitely more than we could ever ask or imagine if we would but ask and believe, and he will do it. Prayer is an act of war against the gates of hell, and we have a God who wants his people to know him. We have a God who wants his ambassadors, that's us, to find and rescue his lost sons and daughters. Our God wants all people to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and we are it. We are it. So use these prayers, and then I'm going to go ahead and just, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Father, so you guys can close your eyes, bow your heads. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you are a good, awesome, and mighty God. You are the creator of the universe, and you are the lover of our souls. Father, with you are justice and mercy. With you is strength. You are mighty in battle, and you are quick to defend. You are our rescuer. You are our savior. You sent your son, and I see him seated next to you in the throne room who has made a way for me to come into you with boldness and power and to make my requests known. You are who I worship, and I bow before you, humbled that you let me in, and humbled that you hear me, as your child and you meet my needs and you bring me brothers and sisters to stand with me. I ask, Father, that you would more and more teach me to pray, 
more and more you would give me your heart for your sons and daughters who don't know you, who are still lost. More and more I ask, Father, that I would lay my life down and I would remember to repent for lack of faith and lack of trust and lack of belief. And in place of that repentance, I would be filled with your spirit of power and boldness and the truth. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if there's anybody in here who doesn't know the Son of God in such a way that you feel like you can come into the throne room and you can ask boldly and you're in need today and you want that relationship, I'm just, nobody's looking around. I'm going to invite you to lift up your hand. Amen. I see your hand. Amen. We have a God who loves us, and as soon as we ask, he runs to meet us. He is so good. So already he is on the move. Already he is moving and he is meeting. Church, go ahead and just repeat this prayer after me. Father God, I thank you for your love. Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice. I see you as my Savior, and I commit to you as my Lord. I ask that you would fill me with your spirit and lead me to do what is right. In Jesus' name, amen.